Okay, this is Jimmy Jive, and you're listening to Motor City Rock Talk. Today, my guest is a physician that formerly lived here in the Detroit metropolitan area back in the 80s. He was in a couple bands. One was called T-Minus, and the other one was Alistair. He then relocated down to Florida for a while and is now living overseas in Switzerland. My guest today is a guitarist who is currently playing with several bands he's recording in his own studio. I think one band he's uh, done and I've heard a lot of good stuff from was called Dr. Frankenstein. Anyway, my guest today is Elliot Chambers. How you doing, buddy? Hello, Jimmy. Thanks for having me on your show and hello to all you Motor City rockers out there. <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about where you were originally from when you were here in the Detroit area. Okay. I was born in Detroit and I mostly grew up on the in Hamtramck. But when I was about five years old, my parents went out to Long Beach, California for about four years. So I was going to kindergarten and first and second grade out in Long Beach, California. And you know, that's the age when my memory clicked in when I was five years old, six years old year old, you know, your memory clicks in pretty good. Right. I remember Detroit prior to that, but when I got back to Detroit, it was quite different than Long Beach, California. Oh, of course. I actually, I came back to, well, yeah, Hamtramck. That's a nice, you know, Hamtramck was a nice, it still is a nice, nice little town. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Had a good nice. music scene back, you know. Yeah, back in the 80s, yeah. Yeah. I seen, uh, I used to go, to, before I was young enough to even go in the bar because I was a big guy and looked older. I was 16. I used to go in a place called Crest Lounge on Joseph Campo. Oh, yeah. And, that, yeah, that place there, they, uh, first they had top 40 hard rock bands. They had, a, they had one particular one called Taste that was really good. I don't know where they're from. But later on, they started having bands like Destroy All Monsters, the mm. reruns of Motor City Mutants and the romantic bands like that. Right. So that was right across the street from my from my grandma's house. And so I was going there and got an early music education from the new wave scene, you know? When did you start your first band? And which one was that? Was that T-minus or was it Alistair or was there someone be- something before that? I guess the first real official band that made a name for itself around there and was playing regularly was called the Crash Rat. And we started out as an original band and then we got started adding more and more covers. We wanted to get some gigs. We wanted to buy a build up a PA. And plus we hired another young guitarist who's a schoolmate of mine, a couple years younger, and he could copy any record. You know, he, he could put him the Aerosmith rock album, he'd learn the whole album. You give him a Van Halen album, the guy would learn the whole Van Halen album. So naturally we started playing more covers, but me myself, I was never at that time figuring out a bunch of records. I didn't have that kind of uh, ear or tech. So I, I could write a song easier than figure than learn one off a record, you know. And so were you the main writer in the band then? Well, actually, me and the other guitarist. Well, when the band first started, actually, we were a trio, and I was the main singer and only guitarist right. in writing the songs. And then later on, when uh, his name is Dave Hamilton, actually, he still plays around Detroit quite frequently. You might have heard of Dave Hamilton band. Yeah, we were a songwriting team. Okay. Sometimes I'd have the whole song, or sometimes we'd collaborate and split a song, or he'd have a song and I'd write the lyrics. I think I was a better lyric writer than him back at that time. I see. That was a good dual guitar team working. We were switching solos and had harmony parts, kind of like Thin Lizzy. Yeah, I love that. Sent you some uh, recordings of the early Crash Rat. I I don't remember that, no, no. You sent me some some of the T-minus and definitely Alistair, who I do remember that band from the Blondies era and all that. But the Crash, the Crash, this Crash band, where did you guys play? Where did you, what play clubs did you get into at that time? Let's see. All right, that's a good one. I know we played at the Red Grape. I know we played at the Red Carpet. Mm-hmm. We played some shows for Sure Shot Agency. Remember, there was that punk rock agency, right? Yeah, and and we and we played at. Uh, we used to have an annual summer party called the Ham Jam, which for years, and also around Hamtramck, like. What? I think we played at Lily's once and I wrote my name in the bathroom, the crash rats in the bathroom. You know, everybody, <laughs> ba- every band had written her name in there. Right. And, she, and Lily, you know, Art Lysak's mom from the Mutant, she got mad and said, you'll never play here again. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. And we, yeah, we, we got we got bands from the notorious punk rock club, so I guess we were pretty badass, you know. But our style didn't really fit in. We were two Judas priests, you know, for them. Uh, we And actually, mentioning the Crest Lounge in Hamtramck, after I'd seen the... Uh, the mutants and romantics there and everybody we played there the crash rats and i think about a month later the bar burned down which place was that the, what, what bar 
it was called the Crest Lounge. Hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah, I that, that's that. going back. You know, this yeah. is before paychecks or. Uh, yeah, I was going to say paychecks. Probably, yeah, before Lily season. We used to play at the Bowery also. Oh yeah, I do remember the Bowery. My band, we played mostly paychecks or the Hamtramck Pub. We never got into Lily's, but I remember those two clubs. Was Smalls around at that time? Smalls? Sm- no, no, no. I forgot the name of the bar there, but that was kind of an old man drinking bar. Right, right, exactly. The Lipton Kona, yeah. Played right. down by the Vidoc off of Kona. There was a place called Uncle Al's Fun Palace. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's cool. Did you play outside of Hamtramck much? I can't almost remember. I know one, yeah, one time we played backing up a band that was a friend of ours called Sky Dancer. Mm-hmm. You remember the Top 40 Sky Dancer yeah. band? They were a good band, and they used to live in Hamtram, and a guy became friends with them, and we back, we opened them, opened up for them at the Taylor Sports Arena or what? It was a big hall, like a big super high, high school hall. Right. Where, oh, yeah, we used to play Falcons all the time. Oh, the Falcon Lounge? Yeah, that's yeah. A, that was a cool place. All right, let's move forward a little bit. So... When did the, which band came first? Was it T minus or Alistair? T minus came first. Okay, and were you still that out was of? That was in 1983. And was that out of a Hamtramck also, or you had you moved on from there? I had moved out of Hamtramck. I I I got I kind of quit and got kicked out of the rap at the same time. Although I'm the one that formed the band. Oh, typical. But they, I kind of had a mutiny. You know, they mutiny me, so I said, okay, you guys mutiny me, and I quit. But I, when I moved to Detroit, I started T minus. With the bass player named uh, Orlando Franklin, who we really knew everybody back then. He's the one that took me by the Seduce House and all kind of stuff. Right. And uh, a drummer named Randy Handley. He was the East Side drummer that that knew all the guys from uh, Ezra. Yeah. You know the people from the Falcon scene. He was a known drummer around. Yeah, and yeah. I had a crazy singer. <laughs> He was a crazy dude, I'm telling you. His name was Harry Keeler. Okay. He was a guitar player, but he was not the style of the band, so he didn't bother to play guitar, and he just, uh, he laid, he, he led the lead vocals. We went over to Canada and recorded. They used to have a special at the place called Overland Studios in Windsor. Okay. We went and recorded a demo there that went out, came out really quite good. And we were playing also at the same places that I mentioned before, uh, Falcons, yeah. and, um, the Bowery, and the... Uh, Maybe, let me remember. T-minus play at Harpo's. I don't think so. I don't know if it was the Ritz around that time or was it called something else? Yeah, I think it was called the Ritz then. Oh, okay. Did you guys play there? With T, with Alistair we did. With T-minus, I'm having a, I'm, I'm drawing a blank spot of where else <laughs> we played, but we were playing. Actually, there was two versions of T-minus. So the second T-minus, we were playing at the Ritz, yeah. And we also played at, I sent you that flyer, the Greystone Hall. Yeah, I remember Greystone. In old downtown Detroit, that's yeah. an old hall, dance hall from the 20s. That's yeah. kind of a famous hall. Yep. And we opened up for the Peter Chris Band. No shit. Wow. Did yeah. you have Did you have management or an agent to do this for you? Or how did you get this? That no, I don't know. I think we were just in touch with the uh, hall. Somehow I, somehow I contacted them and we went by there. Somehow, we, I don't remember how we got the gig, but we didn't have an agent. Agent or anything, agency. Oh wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I expected something. It, it was kind of, uh, oh man, it was kind of poppy and wimpy. Peter Chris was just playing the drums. It could have been anybody in the in the band members. The band itself was kind of unremarkable. It wasn't 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 what you expect on a Kiss level. Put it that right, way. Right, <laughs> right. It wasn't like that. Were you guys still doing the more or less hard rock kind of like you said Judas Priest style stuff as far as your original material? You might as well. You know we made that record Detroit Rocks the World. Right. It's kind of like a Sammy Hagar kind of song. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we were, we were, no, we weren't, we weren't as, uh, Judas Priest style, but we had some heavy songs. It was hard rock for sure. Mm-hmm. And it, let me, if I, if I recall correctly, we weren't really doing any covers with that band second version of T-minus because we were trying to, uh, you know, we made that record and we had a financial backer oh, and um, cool. helped us out with studio time costs. We were recording at Sterling Sound in uh, Sterling Heights. Right. Gordon Carver and his father owned that studio in their basement. So that's where you recorded and, T-minus? Yeah, the, yep, we recorded T-minus to a 16-track task cam he had at the time. But were you a four-piece at that time or did that band have a second guitarist also? Oh, that was four-piece. Uh, the lineup still 
was Randy Hanley on the drums. Right. And uh, we had, I had met these two guys from way, way in the heck up by Armada. Even one guy came originally from Oscoda, but he he was moving down to center line to try to start some rock and roll up. His name was Todd, his name is, is, is he's still around, Todd Parker. Okay. And he was the lead singer and guitarist, is, and uh, his cousin was named Dan Shue, you know? <laughs> and Dan was not that proficient of a bass player, but it was his cousin and he was a cool guy, you know? Right. Imagine Dan Shue was kind of like in the, in the movie The Wizard of Oz, he was like the cowardly lion. He had this <laughs> face like that with a mustache and beard, this long, flowing, reddish hair, okay. you know? <laughs> That's funny. And, and everything was always groovy with him. He's like an old hippie, kind of. Anyway, yeah, we made that record, and I, I can't remember if we were playing the Harpo's. We were, I know we played the Ritz, we played tracks, Showcase Club on Six Mile. We went down to Hamtramck and played at the, did like you play, the Bowery. And, uh, did you play the West Side at all, like the Token Lounge or the Studio Lounge? You know, I never played the Token Lounge or the Studio Lounge. I didn't have any West Side connections. Really? With, that, with none of your bands? No, I mean, actually, with, actually, one time I do remember with the Rats, we played Redford or something for a guy, an agent who was going to help us out named Dag Productions, D-A-G mm. Productions. He was a guy operating on the west side. Right. And we played, and you know, we, it was funny, we played this, it was like a benefit in the daytime that went into the evening. We played somewhere on the bill, but you know, one of the headliners was, was Herman's Hermit. Oh, wow. <laughs> do you remember where that was in Redford? Because I live in Redford. I can't remember where that was in Redford. I know it wasn't Token Lounge. Was it in it a was, club or was it outdoors? Did you say it was a... It was in a club. It was in a, a, a larger bar. Oh, okay. With Herman Sermons. Somewhere, Sermitz, somewhere wow. I believe Redford or Dearborn. It was definitely West Side somewhere. Okay, I get you. I get you. I remember that agent's name, Dennis A. Ganagi. That's a good name. That was Dag Productions. This is a couple other things, too. How did you hook uh, up with him? Probably from the Me Metro Times or something. Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> Right. Yeah. It was the next group then that you played in, was that Alistair? Because I do remember that band from my days of going to Blondie's, like I said. We played Blondie's and saw a lot of metal bands there. Was was that the next group or was there something in between? Well, yeah, in between after T-minus kind of folded, I remember I went I went to California. Oh, okay. Southern California. And I got there and I started a band called the Elliott Band. It was short-lived, but we did get to play at Gazzari's and the Troubadour. Oh, well, that's... That's pretty cool. That, that's worth it. Yeah, and we, you know, it was only a Tuesday night at the Troubadour, but there was a good amount of people there, and they really had a great reaction. And this guy comes up to me and says, I'm Michael Fox. Mm -hmm. Michael Fox Productions, and I booked Gazzari's, and I think you guys are good and, and different. And he gave us, uh, we played there at Gazzari's on a Saturday night. That's the night you want. Yeah, so that was great. Only problem is, is that that was a funny gig, because I had this little, I, I can say it, I guess, I had this little prick drummer. Now, I come to the music room to pick him up, and I said, look, Gary, I'll be there at 4 o'clock, for example, right? Right. And the L.A. traffic is enough to stress you out. So I had to get from Long Beach to Torrance. I go to the rehearsal room, and his drum sets are still set up. You know, his set's still set up, right? Jeez, what the hell? I go, what are you doing? He says, you know what he says? First, you have to take me to my friend's house to pick up some drum cases. Oh, jeez. I said, oh, yeah? Okay. I get in the van. We drive to, uh, it seemed far at the time because I was stressed. To try, and try, you know, we're trying to make it to the club at a certain time. You sure, know what I mean? Sure. And so we get to this place. He goes in there to get these drum cases. It seems like it took him 20 or 30 minutes. He's in there talking. He comes out with the cases. Right? Yeah. Puts him in the van. We help him. Me and the bass player, the notorious Jack Webb was his name. He yeah. looked like a, like a, like a FBI guy, you know? Okay. Anyway, so we get back to the music room with these uh, drum cases. He gets up and pops out and says, I guess you guys can help me load in my drums to the cases. You know what I mean? Like this, right? Right. I'm kind of fuming already, you know what I mean? Yeah, he's thinking you're his roadies. Yeah, I'm fuming, and I and I get out the van with him, and we get in there, and there's this big trash barrel that's full of empty beer bottles and shit, you know, and I accidentally knock that over. Yeah. And you know how crashing glass is the kind of thing that, like, sets you off? Oh, yeah. You know, sure. it's funny, but it's true, right? Yeah, you know? absolutely true. So when that happened, I had to give him. I had to give him the Detroit treatment. You know what I mean? He, I said, you think I'm your punk? And then that's when things went red. You know, he didn't make it to the gig. But you know what I did? Somehow I remembered where the drummer who borrowed us the drum cases lived. 
Oh, he was a drummer? Yeah, I went back to him and asked if he wanted to play the gig. He said, sure. <laughs> he, he put his drums in the car and we went and on the way to the gig, he listened to cassette tapes and memorized the songs. How did it go? How did it go over? Well, he was a good drummer and it, it, it went over okay. We played through the stuff and he didn't he didn't uh, screw things up. We were, of course, we were tighter with the drummer we were rehearsing with. Right, but, um, of course. But the show must go on. Right, absolutely. Do you remember so, what you would have been paid in those days, what those places were paying out in California? Oh, that's a great question. Actually, then it was pay to play. I was going to say, I was wondering you if You know how that was. works, right? They, give, yeah. you, they, they uh, give you some tickets. Tickets to sell, yeah. Yeah, and you have to sell them and bring them the money for the production and advertising costs. Of course, if you sell more tickets than your amount that you need to, it was, I don't know how many tickets, I can't remember the number, but... You you know, you know, you didn't get paid. That's crazy, because that, you know, that became the, the regular here in Detroit for the longest time. It was all about that. Everywhere it was pay to play. Sell your tickets, sell your tickets. You know, they don't want to yeah, do terrible. nothing. They want the talent, but they don't want to pay for it. It's still the same. Unless you're at the level of like bands like Seduce or Halloween or Muggsy from the old days. Yeah, it was all pay to play. I remember going through that crap and just like, I mean, it wasn't, you know, like I said, we played the ham drum scene quite a bit. We were a West Side band, but we played the East Side stuff, you know, quite a bit. And it wasn't yeah, like that. You still pay. Yeah, well, we didn't there, at least not when we were playing there. We didn't have to do it. Of course, we didn't make any money either, which was fine. Yeah. We didn't care if we didn't make any money. We just want to have to take the time to try and sell tickets. They weren't, exactly. they weren't paying. Exactly, you're hustling there. all your friends. Yeah. And sometimes you give away tickets that you cover yourself just because you want certain people to come. Right, exactly. That was what it was. But you know, that, that, yeah, save me tickets and send them to WRIF. Yeah. <laughs> That's that's correct. So anyway, tell me a little bit about about Alistair because, like I say, I'm pretty sure I saw you guys a couple times at Blondie's because Blondie's was a regular stomping ground for me. We played there a few times. I used to go see Deuce, see Seduce play there, and all the metal bands. They'd have national acts that would play there. So yep. was that pretty much your stomping ground for that band? Yeah, it was. And Roosevelt was even a nice guy back then. He liked me, and it was pretty easy to talk to him and get a gig date. He he was and overcomplicated, you know. He'd, right. he'd always be willing to put you on a show. Let's see here. Uh, it wasn't my, you know, it wasn't, I, I, I used to actually work there as a door guy, but I'll tell you that in a minute. That, that came a little bit later. When we played there, we, you know, Alistair was a pretty strong band, like I said about it, because we had this tough drummer who was really tight, mm -hmm. you know. He could really play, and when you have a tough drummer and you and you, you yourself can play guitar good, you know how it is, then, yeah. then you can you can have a tight band. Right, you need that. You gotta have a tight drummer to have a tight band. Yeah, yeah. And this guy had power, too. He had a big stainless steel Ludwig set, double bass. He had wow. his own custom-made drum riser where every piece locked onto the riser deck, you know? Yeah. And so he was, he had a big band. His name was Jim Wolf. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away just a few years ago, RIP. Mm, yeah. But he was, me and him used to ride to rehearsal every time because he lived on 8 Mile. I lived on 6 Mile, and the rehearsal was out in Mount Clinton, Clinton Township. Right. So we were really, me and him were really close. He was a, a big fan factor in that band. Once again, that was Lee singer Todd Parker from T-Minus. Oh, okay, the same guy? Yeah, we hooked up again, and this time it was even better. You know, a lot of Alistair, he came up with the name Alistair, of course, from Alistair Crowley. Right. He was actually kind of a student of, he would claim white magic, but, you know, there's a thin line between white magic and black magic, you know? Yeah, absolutely. But he was writing, we were a good songwriting team, because I was writing these uh, most excellent thrash guitar riffs, mm -hmm. and he was coming up with some lyrics that I never would have dreamed up because he was he was pulling stuff from books. Like for example, we had one called Man to Wolf, and that was and that was about lycanthropy. Like, I said, "What's lycanthropy?" Like, he says, "That's that's when someone turns into a wolf." You know, I said, "No shit." So, <laughs> so he came up with a lot of stuff like the darkest hour, which he says is four to five in the morning. You know, that's right. the darkest hour. Yes. Or the watchers. You know, you got these watchers watching over you. Yeah, yeah. And some other ones. There was another guy which died. That was a good one. Came up with so many good lyrics, and he had to look down, and he. Had Actually, this is one thing you gotta imagine. He was so into, into this magic, he took a marijuana stalk from a big plant, you know? Yeah. Dried out like a piece of wood, like a like a 
He made a, a, a scepter out of it. He took a great big crystal, you know, big white crystal about yeah. the size of a, at least the size of a golf ball, you know? Yeah. And he took some copper wire and wrapped it around that thing. And then he had this ancient writing on this thing, you know? It was really this custom-made scepter. And he would uh, be singing and waving that scepter around it. And he says he'd be drawing images and pushing them out to the crowd, you know? Wow. Yeah, wow. I mean, he, it, so this really gave the band the uh, depth, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, definitely an image. We weren't thinking about image. Susie Two Shoes right. rock and roll. On this side, we weren't on a Slayer level of really outright promoting Satanism or anything like that. It was That's more about the say. magic. So was he pretty magic. much into the occult thing? Because you're saying he's getting these lyrics from books. Were a lot of the songs um, uh, like occult type uh, themes? But yeah, like I said, he had The Watcher and Die Which Die and The Darkest Hour and Man to Wolf about Wolf, you know, right. like Campathy changing with the werewolves. Yes, yes. Um, let me give an example of a vocal one real quick from Man to Wolf. Okay. He was a problem child when the moon was full and bright. His mother was a jackal, but Nanny treated him right. The night he turned 13, his fangs grew sharp and bright. There was no restraining him. He did the devil's right. Tasting raw flesh of lamb and drinking blood of the night. Gathering in churchyards and howling in the moonlight. They smell the scent of graves and lick their chops of delight. The corpses lie there. They haven't got no might. Man to wolf, wolf to man. Freak wow. of nature are mad yet. See what I mean? Yeah, I get that. How did that go over? Did you guys have a pretty good fan base with that band? Yeah, we did. And we were advertising the jam rags a lot. And we had a back, the same backer was helping us. So we had T-shirts. We had a cassette thing out, you know. Uh, and we were also even advertising itself in Rip, Rip Magazine. Oh, okay. For, with quarter page ads. Remember when Rip Magazine was Love Magazine? Yeah, yeah, I sure do. So we actually spent about, I get well, I didn't. The, the backer, so I think he, back then he spent about 1800 bucks. For three issues trying to break it to the metal scene you know were you guys in the jam rag at all too do you remember that one yeah, we were in the jam rag all the time, yeah. We were advertising our cassette in there, and plus when we had gigs, we would have, uh, you know, ads. Uh, Tom Ness was a nice guy. I used to go by and visit him at his, at his basement uh, office. Right. And he was always, he was real cool. And uh, we, we, we were pretty much supportive of his jam rag. It's a good little paper, you know. Yeah. Where did you record the Alistair stuff? You know, I had a Yamaha four-track cassette machine. I'm sure you remember those. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I took that down to Todd's basement in Mount Clemens, and the band was there, and he had a 16-channel, um, maybe it was a bi-amp mixer, some kind of nice mixer. So we sub-mixed the stuff on his larger good mixer with good microphones and ran it into that four-track. So it was just the basement home recording. Wow. Yeah. Should have went to the studio, but we were kind of dissatisfied with, um, at that time, with Sterling Sound. We didn't want to go back there, and that was 300 bucks a day back then. A day? Wow. You're going to pay yeah. that an hour now. Now. Yeah, but back then with Gordon Carver, that was 300 bucks a day, and so we decided we can make something just as good on our own, which which actually didn't come out just as good as a super professional studio. Later on, when we were working on um, the Alistair follow-up, because the first one was the Alistair EP, right. we were coming up with an album called uh, Sin, Sin for Sin, which is another song that Todd penned, and we were recording out in Algonac at some studio. It was an 8-track studio, but the guy had it set up good, and he was getting good sounds and we were recording there. But then the band folded because the bass player was a heating and cooling guy and he was running around working 12-hour shifts, you know? Right. And he wasn't eating correctly and he, and, he, and he wound up being diagnosed as a diabetic. So that, like, messed up the band because we couldn't just find a bass player overnight to learn all the songs or in the, in the time it took. So things kind of fell apart. All right, let's jump a little bit more, a little bit forward. I know that, that you moved to Florida and you were there for a stint. When did you go from Florida to Switzerland and why Switzerland? Okay, well, let's see. When I was in Florida, real quick, I just tell you, I was working in a, a Southern Rock Swamp Rock band and I joined that band. It was funny. They were real cool guys and we did 220 gigs in one year. Wow. Told on my marriage, you know. And so I was on my own after that. Anyway, basically what brought me to Switzerland, I met, I met a Swiss this lady became involved with her and that's how I come over here. That was your that was your whole reason? 
Yeah, I was on a love mission. That's a good reason to go there. Now, how was it when you first got over there? I mean, it, it had to be a culture, kind of a culture shock, wasn't it? A little bit different? Oh, I can tell you exactly how it felt. You know, when it, most Americans, when you go to Europe, you, you feel like you got two left shoes, you know? Right. Yeah, culture shock. Well, put it this way, the city I went to is the capital city called Bern, B-E-R-N. Right. And basically, that was like being in a, in Disney World at the, it, you know, at the center, you know? I mean, it was like it was like being in Disneyland. Right. Full clock towers and the architect and everything, and people they have streets that cars don't drive, and people are all out there sitting out at big um, terraces, and street cars are going by, and yeah, it was uh, much much different culture shock. There's not, there was nothing like that in America I experienced, you know. <laughs> and so I was lucky, just to tell you, musically speaking wise, I was kind of depressed about this this uh, love mission that wasn't working out at all. <laughs> And so I was sitting there in, the, in a what you call a hostel where back where young backpacker people come through, you know, to right. stay. Yeah. Yeah. And I was staying in one of those because I couldn't stay with uh, with the person I was thought I was involved with. They, 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 so I was on my own there, and I'm playing my electric guitar through this little battery amp. And this other kid comes by. His name was Jorhun, and he was from Holland. You know, mm -hmm. he looked like Peter Frampton kind of, you know, like young hippie kid, real cool guy. Yeah. He goes, hey, he goes, you go, you. He goes, you play great. Aren't you going to go up in the city and play? I said, I don't know. Are you allowed to do that? I never did that. He said, sure, I'm going up there to play. And he had acoustic guitar, you know? Yeah. And he invited me to come with him. And we practiced for about an hour and learned about six or seven songs or something. We go up to the town centrum, the center, you know? We get on a corner. It's in our summer and it's a hot day. It was a hot summer back in 1995, that year. And uh, me and him start playing. And all these people gather around. And we had a guitar case sitting down there for donations. And after we played about a, you know our, our eight songs we had you know what I mean like mm -hmm. a half hour or so we played maximum right. we looked in a guitar case and there was 70 bucks that's not bad. Yeah, and I, I was shocked. I said, wow, look at this, you know. And so we started playing together every day and making money like that. And then he had to go and continue his traveling. So I just continued by myself. Right. And then the winners started to come in. And I was still out in the corner playing. <laughs> but, you know, you can you can make there a couple hundred bucks a day, you know. Right. Maybe when I started, and that's not playing all day. You know, I was playing a couple hours here, a couple hours there, going right. around, you know. Sure. And so I was playing there. And, the, and, the, and I had a cold, but I was still playing. And then, the, you know, you're singing out in the cold, the, the steam's coming out your mouth, you know? Right, yeah. This guy comes up to me from the hospital that I'd seen around and never really talked to him. He goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm working. He said, he said come with me. You know, he's, he had a guitar with him. And I, I said, okay, I had heard him playing, but I didn't jam with him or really talk to him much. His name, was jo his name is John Holman from California, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And so he's over there, and he goes, he goes, here's a machine, put put seven bucks in the machine. I said, okay, I put seven bucks in it, and then you get a card, a ticket, and a ticket you can ride every streetcar in the whole city all day. That's pretty cool. Yeah, so me and him teamed up as a guitar duo, and we would ride these streetcars, and it went like this. You get on a streetcar, you take out your guitar out the case, and you know, hello everybody, my name is Elliot, this is my friend John, we're from the USA. We're here to play some music. We hope you're in a good mood for that, everybody. When we start playing, one we play a song together, and maybe two, and then one guy would go collect while one guy continued to play. We'd hop off the hop off the tram, you know. And we'd have about forty bucks from one ride, and we jump on. We just jump on the next train going back the other way and go around the whole city in the winter time by doing that and plus playing in the they call the old town, the old part of town, in the bars. Yeah. You know, we walk in the bar and they see. So they like this. They turn off the jukebox or whatever's playing. We wouldn't even have to ask. Wow. Yeah, and then we start playing, and then we go around and collect, and people already have the money sitting on the table. And the thing is, in Switzerland, this is really interesting. I hope I'm not talking too fast. No, no, you could. Um, their coin denomination is like this. They got a $1 piece, a $2 piece, and a $5 piece coin. Mm. So you're not playing for quarters. Mostly people would give you a couple bucks or five bucks or seven bucks, you know, you, right. every table. Because they, they liked us. We were polite and didn't dress like bums, you know. And right. We played good and sounded good. So we, we would go around those bars and play and play the train. And after all this work, you know what we do? Mm. It's funny. We go to the Irish pub. We go in there, and, and they like us to come in there with all these pockets full of change. And we sit there and 
discount stacks of 10 bucks, you know? Right. Big, long rolls of coins. Okay, we got 180 bucks in change. And they'd gladly take all the change and give us the paper. So what are you up to now? The last thing I think you sent me and you were talking about, and you had, I think, five albums of this, was the Dr. Frankenstein stuff. Is that the most recent project, or and how did that come well, about? that's not the most recent, but I'll make a short story on it. Um, after six albums of uh, Elliot, I said, okay, that's enough. You know, I made the best of, I closed it out with the best of Elliot CD. Uh, I, maybe you can post the link if you'd like to, because all these CDs are available for worldwide shipping from a company called CD Click that's famous based in uh, Rome, Italy that I work with. You can order any of my CDs and you can go on the website and you can look at the artwork from each each album and you can hear a sound bite right. from each song or album. So even so if you, you don't buy a CD, you can hear a, a minute of each song. You can, you can really get a... a you're not on any of the streaming services like Spotify or Apple or any of that stuff? Oh, I'm really against that. You know, I had 12 albums on Spotify and uh, they put them on YouTube, of course, too. But the thing is, is I worked really hard promoting for about a year and a half I joined a company called uh, Distro Kid from New York yeah. and with Distro Kid for us I was I joined as a small record label and that allows you to have five artists and up as many releases as you want for your albums or singles you know mm -hmm. it's all streaming and they take your music and they place it for you on Spotify and Napstar and Apple and right. about 20 different 20 different music portals right. streaming portals and I was advertising for about a year and a half and I was paying about a uh, hundred and seventy nine dollars a year for the membership for as a small record label. You know my record label I have is called Imperial Exile Music that I started in nineteen ninety nine with my first first C D right. and uh, and it's registered with ASCAP as a publisher. Mm -hmm. So I'm a publisher and record label and I'm a ASCAP member, you know, as a song as a composer and as a publisher. But anyway, the saying about that oh yeah. So I was voting very hard for a year and a half, and I had about 35,000 streams, you know? Right. Now, that's not that many streams, but on the other side, it's more, it's better than 200 streams, you know? Sure. Yeah, and so then I got the money on my account from it, and on my, you know, what you call my, um, call it, you know, your account. Hey, cap, 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 cap. Yeah, from, from all my different uh, places that I had the music, and, and it came to about 54 bucks. I said to myself, now, wait a minute. If I do a gig which I still do gigs and so actually sell CDs, physical ones that I have. If I do one gig, I can sell five CDs and have the same 50 bucks in one night, you know? Right, right. So I just felt like, you know, all this stuff, and I'm paying a membership and, and a advertising, you know, all the time, posting stuff, and, and I must have did something to get 35000 Streams, right. But the money wasn't right, and I just feel, I don't want to support this system that's making musicians broke. Anyway, I, when, when I, going back to Dr. Krankenstein, the year was 2005, and uh, I came up with the name Dr. Krankenstein while I was driving on a freeway one day, and I met some guys, some good guys that started a band. They actually had a studio, too, which was cool. So we were recording, playing mostly originals, a few covers, and uh, then we produced the first uh, Dr. Krankenstein album called Operation Live. But, but to be honest, yeah, I'll tell you our corporate secret. This is a Piro Exile corporate secret. The album was actually recorded in the uh, studio. I know. You added, treated it you added the audience. live effects. Yeah, I know. I knew it's that. Uh... And so now, but it sounds really like a kick-ass concert that you want to be at. Oh, you know yeah, I mean? for sure. For sure. It sounded almost too good because live, nobody ever sounds that clear live. So there's a total now of uh, five Dr. Krankenstein albums. Right. That was from 2005 to 2021. So it wasn't like I was producing an album every year, but the albums kept getting better and better. If you might have noticed some of the tracks from the last album, Dr. Krankenstein, Crank It Up, got a lot of kick-ass shit on it. And so when that band folded, a few years later, I was still in touch with those guys and friends, of course. It wasn't one of these bitter breakups. Right. And, and he told me he got a new Sonic system, you know, and he told me I could have this old Mackie system, and he gave it to me for a gift. Wow, that's pretty nice. Yeah, and, and so I at the time had maybe a Tascam Porto, Porto studio, right. but uh, anyway, he gave me that, and that was in the year um, 2015. I started working with that, and I still have it now, and that's how I cut all my recordings that you've heard. I use that, that technology from 2003. <laughs> <laughs> right. Hey, if it works, which it works. Antique, yeah, which is antique in the digital world, but the difference is, is it's like a really physical mixer that's hands-on, like old school, you know? 
after Frankenstein's albums and stuff, I, I made some other albums too called Fat Wallet and uh, another thing called The Revolution of Truth and also Peggy Punk, which is my wife Marga. And uh, I produced the EP and album for her because she earned her rank singing backing vocals on Frankenstein albums. There you go. There you go. Good for her. And I said, the microphone likes your voice. We got to, we got to, you got to, and she, oh, I don't know, you know. And so I think I sent it to you. If not, you can hear it on that uh, location with all my albums. I right. know I sent you the address. And anyway, she wrote a song called I Don't Need Anybody. You know, I, I wrote all the songs for her and played all the instruments. Uh -huh. But she's the star and she did all lead vocals and it came out really fantastic. Now, getting back to what I'm doing now, I produced a, a psychedelic kind of Hendrixy, Jimi Hendrix kind of thing called Fat Wallet back in 2016. So I started forming Fat Wallet Blues Band, Blues Rock Band. And currently I have a lineup that's reaching the two and a half year point. So you know what that means. Right. And yeah. uh, so we played, a, we played about three, so I say 15 gigs, maybe averaging a gig or two a month, you know. Uh -huh. Actually more I don't know the exact number, but we're playing next week. I've got a gig next Saturday here in Switzerland at a place called the Tiger Bar. Well, Elliot, I'm going to let you go. i got some other things to do, and I'm sure you do, because we're probably getting a little later there over in Switzerland. It's been great talking to you, buddy. I'm going to look up some more of that stuff on YouTube and all that, and be sure to send me that link you're talking about where people can actually purchase your music, because I think everything I've heard from you is just really, really cool. Hey, and I, I appreciate that, man, because you know you're way around the block, too, and us Detroit guys, you can't fake, you know? That's right. You Absolutely. Can't, we, we know we, we grew up with the classic hard rock stuff like the Who. Yeah, the Zeppelin and Black, and Black Sabbath, Sabbath all, yeah. all the cool shit. So you, you can't you can't handle some baloney and we're going to say, oh, that's great. <laughs> all right, brother. And, and if, you're welcome very much, Jimmy Jam. I'm glad your show, Motor City Rock Talk, is out there. And I am going to advertise when the, my broadcast is coming on. And I'm going to also post, uh, I'm going to listen to the one coming up about Joey from uh, Muggsy and keep up with, I, oh, by the way, I talked to Mickey St. Clair last night. Oh, did you? That's great. Yeah, we had a, we had a blast talking together, and I asked him if I came to Detroit, could he make it down to Detroit and play, and he said he could. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, he'd make the trip. He's done it before. But yeah, you can come, and we, you can stay overnight, because it's a four-hour ride, you know? Yeah, I know. Well, Elliot, yeah. like I said, I'm going to let you go, buddy. You have a good night, and we'll keep in touch. Yeah, and all you listeners out there, thank you for being out there for us, for me, and for Jimmy. Support his show, pass the word along about it. He He's keeping the spirit of Detroit music alive on his YouTube channel, Motor City Rock Talk. I appreciate that, man. Thank you for the plug. I really appreciate That's it. That's right. <laughs> yep, and I hope my uh, my interview is up to, up to par and quality of all the great people that he's had and will have in the future oh, most on definitely. his show. Most definitely. You don't worry about that, man. Just Keep cool. keep doing what you're doing, man. Just keep rocking. Uh, I will, man. I got at least I'm happy. I got a gig next uh, next uh, Saturday, so I got to go do some rehearsal time. And actually, tomorrow in my studio, I'm recording a, a metal band that's having a session for eight hours. They're hiring my studio. You know, I have my recording studio. Yeah. Uh, Imperial Imperial Exile I E M recording studio, and that's with my uh, old technology I told you about from nice. 2003. Yeah. <laughs> but these guys like this sound and I'm going to record them so uh, I got the work tomorrow on a Sunday. There you go. Keeping busy, man. Keeping busy. All right, again, yeah, I gotta, I'm going to let you go, man. I really can't, hope you take care, man, and have a good time. You have a good weekend and rock and roll. You bet and, you, And uh, we'll talk again. I'm going to I'll give, you, I'll give you a call one time when we don't have an interview. Thank right, you ever buddy. so much. I appreciate you having me on your show. You bet, man. You bet. All right, okay. man. Bye for now, everybody. All right. Take care, buddy. Bye-bye, right, Jimmy Jam. All right, buddy. You take care now. You too. Till next time. All right, buddy. Bye-bye. See ya. Okay, that was Elliot Chambers, who formerly had a couple bands, actually three. I only knew of two from the Detroit area back in the 80s, T-Minus, and, of course, Alistair. He's also played in several other bands over in Europe, where he's living now in Switzerland. Got his own recording studio and a couple projects he's worked on there. I wish him the best of luck, and I know he's going to keep rocking. And that's what I have to say to you. Keep rocking.